Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Uh, we are going to pick up where we left off last time, um, talking about distributed decision making. And, um, and just to set the context here, uh, consensus problem basically is one in which we have many nodes in the system. And by the way here, just in case you were wondering, a node is, is a separate uh, physical box that might be connected only via network. Um, some nodes can crash and stop responding, and eventually all nodes decide on the same value for a set of proposed values. So that's basically the consensus issue here that we're trying to solve. Um, and the key thing that makes this difficult is basically the fact that nodes might crash and stop responding, and then they come back, and we want to make sure that they uh, still, everybody kind of does the same thing, and that's what we're going after here. Uh, in a little bit, we'll also talk about what happens if nodes are actively malicious and trying to screw up the process, but we're not there yet. So distributed decision making is, uh, for instance, the notion of uh, all of the nodes are going to choose between true and false or commit and abort. These are kind of equivalent ideas. And it's going to be atomic in the sense that all of them will uh, decide on true or all of them will decide on false, but we'll never get a mixed uh, grouping of them. And equally important, but um, something that sometimes gets forgotten in this whole process is uh, making sure that once the decision is made, it's not forgotten. So if you have a set of nodes and they make a decision and then they immediately crash and lose all their information, then it's as if uh, they never made the decision in the first place. And this is, uh, just to remind you, this is the durability or D portion of ACID, okay? And um, in a global scale system, uh, D gets a little bit trickier, but we talked last time about erasure coding or massive replication um, or even blockchains uh, have a replication aspect to them for getting our durability. So we were at the very end of last lecture talking about two-phase commit, and really we came into two-phase commit because we couldn't solve the general's paradox. If you remember, the general's paradox was <coughs> two or more parties have to decide on a time in which to perform some action like attacking, and the uh, messages going back and forth are unreliable, okay? And really uh, what we showed is that this is uh, impossible to do. And uh, so what we're gonna do instead is a simpler problem, which is we're gonna get the machines to agree to do something or not do it atomically, but we're not gonna force them to all agree on a time, all right? Um, and so the two-phase commit protocol, roughly speaking, has two phases, uh, not surprisingly, right? The prepare phase is one in which a coordinator, and there is a single coordinator in this, basically requests that all participants make a promise to either commit or uh, abort or roll back the transaction. And participants are gonna record uh, their promise in the log, and then they're gonna acknowledge by saying whether they will commit or abort. And uh, the main, uh, the coordinator will basically make a decision to uh, either commit or abort based on what it hears from the participants. And essentially, if any of them say that they want to abort, then the coordinator will abort. And if all of them say that they're going to uh, commit, then only and only then will it actually uh, commit. Okay, so the commit phase is basically that point after we've heard from everybody, and we make a decision that either everybody wants to commit, so we'll commit, or um, uh, somebody doesn't want to commit, in which case we'll abort. Okay, and a key aspect of this is the persistent log on every machine that's participating, both the uh, coordinator and all of the additional participants. And what is this log doing for us? Well, this is basically helping uh, those nodes remember what decision they've made so that if they crash and come back up, they will continue to make the same uh, decision. And this is where two-phase commit gets interesting because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this uh, atomic decision in which everybody makes the same choice and acts on that same choice, regardless of uh, the fact that some of these nodes may crash and, uh, and come back in the middle of it. Okay, so let's set this up a little bit more. Uh, we were uh, starting to kind of look at the meat of this and any of you who have, uh, um, 
and any of you who have actually started in on uh, experimenting with homework eight will kind of understand what's going on. Now we have a question in the chat here, basically saying not yet convinced of this process, what if the coordinator fails to receive an abort? Well, if the coordinator fails to receive an abort, um, basically that's a timeout and it will assume it's an abort. Okay, so we can basically make uh, the decision that uh, any time we don't hear from somebody, we're going to assume that they're aborting. And you'll see that that allows us to keep our atomicity on this process. Now, um, so the coordinator basically initiates this protocol and asks every machine to vote on transaction. And the two possible votes that um, the, uh, the uh, participants can come up with is commit or abort. And uh, the commit only uh, will happen if it's unanimously approved by everybody. And the, uh, the coordinator doesn't receive, it, the coordinator waits until it receives votes from everybody. And if it times out, then it's gonna assume that somebody was uh, going to abort and it will uh, treat that as such. Now, uh, preparing in the prepare phase, um, if a machine has decided to agree to commit, uh, what it does at the point that it's made that decision is it's guaranteed that it will accept the transaction. All right. And, and what does it do? Well, first of all, after it's decided that it's going to accept the transaction, it makes a, a little mark in its log uh, before it responds, saying that um, it will remember the decision. So even if it crashes before it tells its decision to the uh, to the coordinator, if it, when it comes back up, it looks in its log and it sees what it decided to do, and it will keep with that decision once it's made it. Now, if it agrees to abort instead, we have the same idea. The machine is guaranteed that it'll never accept the transaction, even if it's crashed and comes back up again. And so this is re recorded in the log. And so the machine will remember that decision if it ever crashes and restarts. So uh, this commit phase or the finishing phase, uh, basically the coordinator learns that all machines have agreed to commit and uh, records its decision uh, to commit in the log and uh, applies its transaction and tells all the voters to uh, go ahead and um, commit and uh, we're good to go. And even if the, uh, if the coordinator crashes and come back, comes back up after it's made the decision to commit, it'll see that in its log. If it comes back up before it's made that decision, it's gonna assume uh, that it's missed out on some uh, messages from the, the participants and it'll just go ahead and, and tell everybody to abort. So the abort uh, action is when the coordinator learns that at least one machine is voted to abort, um, records its decision in the log, and uh, basically tells the voters to abort. And if you notice, basically, uh, because there's no, no machine can take back its decision because of the log, we will get this atomicity out of this. Okay. Now there's a question here that if a node crashes, is, crashes indefinitely, is a backup node pulled in and used in its place? Now, um, the answer is uh, no. And as you have identified here, the, one of the big issues with two-phase commit is it can potentially block indefinitely in bad circumstances. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so two-phase commit by its uh, nature does not have the ability to pull in backups. Okay, it's a, it's a simple algorithm and we'll go from there. Now, um, so here we go with uh, an example, just so that you, um, know about it. So the coordinator says, oh, I'd like to know what you want. The workers uh, wait for that. And if they're ready to commit, they'll send back a commit. Uh, if they're ready to abort, they'll send back an abort. Uh, the coordinator waits until it hears from everybody. If it gets a vote commit from everyone, um, it'll send a global commit. Uh, otherwise, it'll say a global abort. And then finally, the worker waits until it hears uh, the status from the coordinator. And if it's a global commit, it'll do a commit operation. If it's an abort, it'll do an abort operation. And notice, by the way, that regardless of what the worker decided to do um, during the first phase, uh, it, if it hears that it's supposed to abort during the second phase, it will abort. Okay. Uh, so here's some examples. For instance, here's a failure-free example. The coordinator says vote request. They all say commit. Uh, the coordinator says global commit. And we're good to go and everybody commits. Now, this might be a good time to say, well, what does it mean to commit? Well, remember for a moment here that this algorithm is really just trying to make a decision, commit or abort, 
that's it. And it's an atomic decision. So they all make that uh, decision to do something. But what it is that they do is uh, what you're applying it to. So for instance, it could be that there was a, um, an update to a database. If it's a key value store that you're going to um, add this key with this value to the global data store, the global commit would be that everybody has agreed that should happen. Okay, and so the, the uh, commit and abort actions are um, basically the global decision on what to do with some proposed action prior to that. Now, um, basically, you can also view this as a state machine on both the coordinator and uh, the workers. So the coordinator has a simple state machine with four states, starts in init, um, and when it's ready to start, it basically sends out a vote request, and, uh, and then it waits until it hears from everybody. Uh, if it hears a vote commit from everybody, it goes forward. If it hits a, uh, hears a vote abort from anybody, then it'll send out a global abort. Okay, the worker uh, kind of looks like this. So the worker basically also has uh, an init. Um, and if it hears a vote request and it wants to commit, it'll go to the ready state and wait. Uh, otherwise, if it, um, if it wants to abort, it'll go ahead just to an abort state. Now the question of what happens if a, a worker misses a global commit, a good example of that would be if it crashes and comes back up. Well, at that point, um, it can't make any forward progress because it doesn't know what the decision of the coordinator is. And so at that point, the worker can start polling the coordinator to see whether there's a decision yet. All right. Uh, now, um, so work, how do we deal with worker failures, for instance? So um, if you notice here, that's uh, sort of a good segue into the previous question. Um, the state that I've colored in red is one where the coordinator is waiting to hear. And uh, the failure really only as affects states in which the coordinator is waiting for messages. And uh, the coordinator only waits for votes in the wait state. And uh, once it hears that there's an issue, it will, um, you know, if it times out or whatever, then it will assume that we're going to do an abort. Okay, and if it doesn't receive n votes, it times out and sends an abort. So the way that this protocol is set up is it's set up so that whatever failure cases might happen, we will always keep the main constraint, which is that either everybody agrees to commit or everybody agrees to abort and we don't get a 50-50 or whatever. Some of them do one thing and some of them do the other. So here's an example of a worker failure. So the coordinator sends out the requests, but only two of them come back and nothing happens, eventually there's a timeout, and at that point the decision is made to abort. And since that's recorded in the log, by the way, even if the, um, the coordinator crashes and comes back up, whatever, um, there'll never be confusion on this. And if the worker three eventually reboots, it can ask the, the coordinator and it'll find out that abort was what happened. So how did, the, uh, how did the workers deal with coordinator failure? Well, this is a little more interesting here. So. Um, you know, we wait in one of a couple of places. One, we wait for the vote request from the coordinator. Um, and uh, in that instance, uh, you know, if, if nothing happens and we time out, we just kind of wait to, to hear what's going on. And eventually, uh, if we want to commit, we go to the ready state and we're going to wait to find out what the decision was. If we decide to abort, then we know what the decision is going to be, which is abort. Okay. Now, a uh, worker waits for the vote request in init. Voters can time out and abort. Worker waits for global star messages in ready. And uh, if the coordinator fails, the worker has to wait. Okay, and the reason for this is once the worker has said vote commit, it has to find out what the decision was. It has no idea. And the only way that it can move forward is by hearing from the coordinator. So in this instance, basically what we find out is, uh, or what happens here is we have to just stall. There's really no other option here. And so this is part of why this is a blocking protocol, as you can see. Uh, so here's an example of the coordinator failure, failing. Maybe it sends out vote requests, but nothing happens. We eventually time out and all the workers might abort in the init stage. Or here, uh, we send out vote requests. We go forward uh, by everybody saying committing. And eventually the coordinator uh, crashes. At that point, the, uh, the workers can't do anything. They're all waiting in that ready state. But when the coordinator comes up, it figures that it's missed some messages and it just says abort. All right. So uh, all nodes have to use stable storage to store the current state. 
and stable storage is basically non-volatile. It could be a disk, it could be SSD or NVRAM, whatever. Um, and on recovery, then nodes can restore the state and resume. So you know, coordinator aborts and init waiter abort, etc. We can list all of these out. The key thing is that this algorithm is one such that no matter uh, when and and uh, how the nodes crash and come back up, if we do the right thing with the log, we'll always maintain our atomic behavior, um, where they all either decide to commit or they all decide to abort. Um, so really, the kind of the key issue here is blocking for the coordinator to recover. Uh, you know, a worker waiting for global decisions can ask a fellow workers about their state, for instance. So if we're in the ready state and we don't know what's going on, we could ask other workers. Um, and if they've already gotten a global commit, then we can uh, take that decision and move forward. Okay. Um, does uh, some vary the question that's come up is does some variation on this system allow for non unanimous decision making, um, i.e. simple majority voting. So the answer is not the two phase commit. So two phase commit is an all or nothing. We'll talk about some uh, majority voting kind of options in just a moment here. Um, so if another uh, worker is in a board or commit, then the global coordinator must have sent a global uh, message. Um, and the worker can safely abort or commit uh, respectively. And so basically there are cases in which we can uh, exchange information between the workers to find out what, uh, what happened if we missed it or it was lost. If another worker is still in the init state, um, then uh, both workers can decide to abort in that case, for instance. Um, if all workers are in the ready, uh, then we really need to block because we do not know really what the, the coordinator is going to do. You might guess, for instance, that, well, because they're all in the ready, they all said vote, commit, and so therefore the coordinator is going to choose to commit. But in fact, the coordinator might have crashed and come back up and lost its state. Um, and th in that instance, it's going to abort. So we really have to wait when we're all in ready to move forward. OK. So why is distributed decision making desirable? And the answer is fault tolerance. If we want to have a bunch of nodes together making a decision and we'll wait until they all make the same decision, then we know that we uh, aren't um, do making our decisions based on faulty information. A group of machines come to a decision even if one or more of them fail during the process because we come back up again eventually uh, and move forward. And after the decision's made, the, recall, the result is recorded in many places and so uh, we'll know what the decision was even if they subsequently crash. So why is two-phase commit not subject to the, the uh, general's paradox? I actually saw somebody ask that question um, on Piazza too. And really, two-phase commits about all nodes eventually coming to the same decision, but not necessarily at the same time. And that's really, uh, we're allowing reboot and continue and reboot and continue to gather information so that eventually they all have recorded in their logs their decision and we can make uh, an atomic decision. The general's paradox had this problem that we were never quite sure that our messages made it through, and therefore there was no way to settle on a time for sure. Okay. So an undesirable feature of two-phase commit is blocking, as we've mentioned. And uh, one machine can be stalled until another site recovers. You know, site B writes prepared to commit in its log and sends a yes to the coordinator and crashes. Site A crashes. B wakes up, checks its log, realizes that it has voted yes, and now it's stuck until um, B is basically blocked until A comes back. And so there really is nothing in this protocol that allows nodes to not eventually be present without blocking forever, okay? And so that's an issue. And a block site essentially holds resources, which might be locks or pages pinned in memory or whatever until it learns the fate of the update. And so that's an issue. All right, so there's a number of interesting alternatives to two-phase commit. Uh, there's three-phase commit, which is one more phase, and it allows nodes to fail or block, and it's more of a majority voting kind of scenario. It's a little better. Paxos is a very popular example. It's an alternative that's used by Google and others. Um, it does not have the two-phase commit blocking problem. It was uh, another protocol developed by Leslie Lamport. mentioned him uh, last time. Uh, there's no fixed leader, and it can choose a new leader on the fly and deal with failure. Uh, this is extremely fault tolerant. There's some that would claim that this is extremely complex and there's even been a lot of papers about you know, taming the complexity of Paxos and so on. But Google 
seems to have done so, and uh, they're using it actively. Um, Raft is a, a variant developed at Stanford, which is an alternative to Paxos, which the claim of John Osterhout at Stanford and his students are essentially that this is much easier to understand and therefore much easier to implement correctly. Um, but that's, a, that's another uh, fault tolerant version. But what's interesting is what happens if one or more of the nodes is malicious? And this is uh, an interesting question where malicious is actively trying to screw up the protocol. All right, um, hold on a second. I'm gonna pause, I'll be right back. Okay, so um, the question that's on the, sorry about that, I'm back. So the question that's on the uh, chat here is, um, which uh, protocol is commonly used in industry so right now, Paxos is pretty commonly used. Um, two and three phase commit are, um, have been common for a long time in databases, distributed databases, but um, Paxos is used pretty widely by Google and there are some libraries that do Paxos. Um, and, uh, so now um, what happens, so there's another question here uh, with workers waiting once the server crashes. I'm not sure I understand that question. Did I miss the middle of it? Oh, okay. So um, now uh, what's interesting about these other protocols up top here is that if a node is malicious, which means that it's been broken into or it's running a, um, a version of the protocol that is uh, designed to mess up the decision making, then they are not resilient against that. So even though things like three-phase commit, Paxos, Raft, et cetera, might be resilient against failures and may manage to get forward as long as, move forward as long as there's, say, um, a, a majority that are still functioning properly, if one of those nodes is actually malicious, then they're not. And so uh, this becomes an interesting question. Um, what do we... Uh, what do we do in those that instance, okay? And so um, we have another Leslie Lamport paper that was quite interesting. Uh, I'll put up uh, both the Paxos paper and the Byzantine Generals papers up on the resources page. I may have done that already. Um, the uh, Byzantine Generals problem is as follows. There's one general and N uh, minus one lieutenants, okay? And so uh, N total participants here. And uh, the, some number of these are malicious, okay, or insane, or going to act uh, weirdly, okay, or, or incorrectly or maliciously. And so the, the uh, question is, what do we do then? And uh, before we can actually solve the problem, we really have to figure out what we're doing. So uh, what we want as our, uh, our semantics here. And what we'd like is the commanding general is sending an order to all of his lieutenants, and we'd like the following integrity constraints to apply here. Uh, IC1 says all loyal lieutenants, which are those that are not malicious, obey the same order. So if you notice here, these two lieutenants um, are uh, the ones in the red hats, basically are both deciding to attack. And if the general is loyal and not basically malicious, then the, uh, the loyal lieutenants will do what the general says. Okay, so how could a general be malicious? Well, a general could tell all of his different lieutenants to do something different. And uh, in that instance, then um, we're gonna say that the general is malicious. And what happens then is the remaining loyal lieutenants are all going to uh, do the same thing. Okay, so um, they're always gonna have IC1 in, in the good instance in which the general is loyal. Um, they will also do what the general wants, okay? Now, notice that I've said here, I've sort of introduced some terminology so or some notation. So one of them is that um, there's going to be F malicious entities in the system here and N total entities, okay? And um, so what's interesting about the original paper from Leslie Lamport is he shows that uh, we can't solve the Byzantine generals problem with N equals three because they're one of uh, malicious player can basically mess everything up. So here we have an instance where uh, one lieutenant is malicious, the general is not, this lieutenant uh, is not, so the blue ones are not malicious. And uh, the general tells each of them to attack, uh, 
but the lieutenant, uh, the blue lieutenant, has no idea uh, whether the general is malicious or not. So it's got to find out what the uh, the tan lieutenant says. And the tan lieutenant says, "Well, the general told me to retreat." And so now this blue lieutenant is stuck because it has no way to make a decision uh, that will let him satisfy um, both the interactive consistency uh, constraints IC1 and IC2. Uh, in the case of the general being malicious, um, you know, it says attack to one and retreat to the other, then this poor lieutenant on the left is once again uh, lost because uh, he's hearing attack from the general and retreat from the lieutenant. And if you notice, these two scenarios, the one on the left and the right, are the same uh, as far as this uh, good lieutenant is concerned. And so basically, the uh, impossibility result says you can't solve this problem uh, with n equals 3. And uh, in fact, then it quickly generalizes to show that if you have f faults or f malicious nodes, then you have to have n greater than 3f total participants in order to solve this problem. OK. So there's a bunch of algorithms that exist to solve the problem. Um, the original algorithm was uh, purely um, a thought process because it was exponential in n, which is never great, right? Uh, newer algorithms, uh, although new is uh, perhaps overstating it since they're from 1999, basically have a complexity that's about order n squared. That's supposed to be n squared, sorry about that. Um, in the uh, number of nodes, and so a message complexity of n squared is doable but you're um, probably not going to want n to be too big, OK? Um, and uh, I will say that I've even designed systems with the MIT version of, uh, of the Byzantine general solution um, where we kept n to 4 or 7 or 10 and not too much bigger, because then the message complexity gets pretty complicated at that point. So um, this uh, Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm, BFT, is what this Castro and Liskov algorithm is called. And it basically allows multiple machines to make a coordinated decision, even if some subset of them, basically less than n over 3, are malicious. Okay, And so what you can think of, again, going back to our earlier discussion of distributed decision making, is that requests kind of come in from uh, somebody, a client or, or one of the participants. They go through this. Uh, decision mill where they're running the uh, n squared algorithm that solves Byzantine general's problem. And as long as these red uh, malicious nodes are less than n over 3 uh, total, then what comes out are distributed decisions that are um, agreed upon by all the non-malicious parties. OK? And so that's kind of a decision. This is a pretty key advantage to a good uh, Byzantine and general's solution is that we can have uh, a coordinated set of nodes that together come to a decision, even if a few of them are malicious. All right, questions on this? And notice, by the way, uh, in reference to some questions earlier, that um, we're not talking, uh, we're talking here that more than two thirds of the nodes have to be non-malicious in order to solve this. In the, in the previous algorithms we were talking about that aren't uh, tolerant to malicious nodes, it's only, you only need more than half to be, uh, to be uh, non-faulty, uh, non okay? More than half to be non-faulty, you can have uh, up to half of them being faulty. All right, so. Now, enter blockchain. So what's interesting these days is, of course, there's lots of uh, discussion of blockchain since the 2009 introduction of Bitcoin way back when. Um, it's hard to believe that's been uh, over a decade ago. But uh, what's interesting about blockchain algorithms is let's start with what a blockchain is. So blockchain uh, is a set of transactions that are backlinked with hash pointers. And those of you that have taken 161 or know something about um, security will know um, that what this really means is you take the contents of uh, a block on the left and you run a, a cryptographically secure hash over it, like a SHA-256, and you put the resulting uh, hash into the next block. And as a result, as long as you uh, know that hash, it's impossible to insert something uh, on the left. Okay, uh, without being detected. 
And so the way a blockchain typically works is mostly everything's in a single chain, except at the very head where uh, new transactions are being added. And in those cases, um, there are some possibility uh, possibilities for the new head or some branches. And what happens is eventually the one uh, branches with the longest chain uh, become probabilistically the, the final head. And if you run this long enough, it, uh, all the new stuff eventually looks uh, like what I have on the left here. Okay, so blockchain itself is a chain of uh, blocks connected by hashes to a root block. Um, the chain has no branches except for at the heads and blocks are authentic part of the chain when they have the right authenticity info in it. Now, if you were taking 161 and not talking about Bitcoin or something like that, you probably think that something's authentic by there being a signature. Well, that's a one way to do it. Um, in Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum or some of these other blockchains, what actually happens is the head's chosen by some consensus algorithm. Um, and in many of them, the head is basically chosen by solving a really hard uh, problem. Um, some uh, extensive search of the hash chain space to find, um, to find uh, cryptographic uh, proof that uh, this is the right head. Okay, and this is the job of the miners who try to find basically uh, a way to put a, some set of bits into the packet such that when you take a hash, the resulting hash has some number of zeros. And we can talk about that offline or at office hours if you guys are interested. Um, but this is uh, called a proof of work because you have to burn a lot of cycles on a, a processor and burn a lot of energy to get it. And uh, selected blocks above here presumably already have the proof of work in them. This uh, hashed one I've got that's green is an example of one that's got a proof of work but isn't known by everybody yet. And so it's not um, considered the, the, um, the final chain yet. It's still kind of tentative. Okay, and this is a longest chain wins kind of scenario. Now, why this is good for uh, Bitcoin is that these transactions represent the exchange of money um, for, uh, you know, if you buy coffee with some Bitcoin, um, that's a, an awful lot of coffee these days still. Uh, but but um, it used to be that Bitcoins were worth, um, you know, $70 or a few dollars, and it made sense to have some micro Bitcoin spent for coffee. Now they're worth thousands of dollars, and uh, it's a little bit less obvious that you want to do that. But uh, you might ask a question about, is this blockchain algorithm a distributed decision-making algorithm? And the answer is really, you can think of it that way, because once we've got some item, uh, some choice of commit or abort, that's in one of these solid green blocks that has been held on, that has been part of the long chain, then you can't change it. And so now it's a distributed decision that everybody will agree on. And so if you look at uh, the way that, for instance, a typical blockchain algorithm might work, here's the cloud. You've got these miners um, that are around the world trying to solve these uh, proof of work problems. And uh, what happens is they're basically copying uh, information to each other. Um, and uh, as soon as somebody solves a proof of work, it's very quickly replicated to everybody else. And that uh, person's uh, success at solving that problem uh, gets them a few uh, fractions of a Bitcoin and everybody hears about it and that becomes the new head of the chain, okay? And so the way you'd use this for distributed decision making is you'd make a proposal to one of the miners that instead of being like a Bitcoin transaction would be something like, I would like to commit the following record to my um, to my uh, distributed database uh, and depending, it doesn't matter who you send it to, eventually they send it to everybody else and those transactions get put into the blockchain and um, they become distributed decisions. Okay, and so a decision in this case means the proposal is locked into the blockchain, could be a commit abort decision, could be a choice of, a choice of some value or a state transition, whatever. Um, you know, if you put give a proposal and you get a knack back, you might have to retry because something went wrong. But once it's in the blockchain, then everybody can observe it. And those of you that know anything about uh, Bitcoin know that um, there's a, a much smaller number of miners than there are people that are, are observing and using the blockchain. And pretty much anybody who gets a copy of the blockchain can verify the decision. So we have the nice uh, property with blockchains here of um, 
basically the decisions that are locked into the blockchain can be verified by everybody. Okay, and so that's, um, so I would say that yes, the blockchain is a distributed decision-making algorithm. And interestingly enough, there are a number of these out there now um, that uh, use not necessarily the Bitcoin blockchain, but use other blockchains to uh, solve the Byzantine agreement problem, uh, despite the fact that there are malicious parties in the system. And um, what's interesting is, whereas back here, uh, when we talk about say the MIT BFT algorithm, which is N squared number of messages, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, excuse me, blockchain style uh, Byzantine general solutions tend to be uh, closer to linear in the number of nodes. And so you can have many more nodes involved. And so this is interesting and kind of exciting to see where this goes. Okay, And these, are, these uh, Byzantine agreement algorithms are relatively recent within the last five years or so. Um, so there's a little bit a uh, question uh, on the on the um, chat here about saying a little bit more about what the block contains. I'm not going to say too much more because I don't want to spend too much more time here, but take one of these green blocks. What it is is it's a series of transactions from different people. Um, so when you when different people propose a transaction, it's epidemically sent to everybody. And what the miners do is they collect all the new transactions into a block and then they uh, and then they start adding numbers to that block and hashing it, and that's the problem they're solving. And the first one to figure out sort of which four bytes to add to the set of transactions such that the new hash over it is uh, got a, a number of zeros uh, that's specified by the current state of the system, uh, solves the problem and gets the, gets the coins. And so from the standpoint of us discussing Byzantine agreement here, really what the proposals are they go into these green blocks and those proposals are things like commit or abort and usually have attached to them you know commit this key value uh, pair to my global store okay i hope that helps a little bit um, to the question that's on the chat um, the other thing i will point out is you can sort of see one of the big problems here there's a lot of people that like to think of blockchains as the, the solution to all of the world's problems. And what they do is they talk about rather silly things like, I'm going to put my videos into the blockchain because then they're guaranteed to be authentic and everybody can verify that. Well, if you look at what's going on here, the, any data you put in the blockchain gets replicated all over the world and it's extremely expensive process. And so putting everything into the blockchain is, is actually a, a pretty, um, you know, almost a non-starter, although um, many people forget and are doing it. Um, so, but uh, there's another question here on the chat, um, but I'm going to, let's talk about this offline if we could, Jeffrey. I think that's a more extensive question. Um, okay, so um, anyone in the word can, world can verify the result of the decision-making. All right. Um, so uh, now I want to switch gears a little bit. And uh, if you notice, uh, yeah, you can Google, by the way, all, all sorts, Google blockchain. There's a lot of really interesting information on there. OK, so now let's move forward um, a bit here. And uh, there are many levels of networking uh, protocol. And what I wanted to do before we move forward with some of the more interesting distributed file storage systems and peer-to-peer um, -peer protocols is I want to very quickly get some common terminology for everybody here on some networking terms, okay? And um, many of you have probably taken 168, um, so uh, some of this will be things you've heard before, but I just want to make sure we all have this. Um, so the network networking protocols are um, abstracted at a number of different levels. There's the physical level, which is the uh, uh, mechanical and electrical network itself sort of how the zeros and ones are represented. There's the link level, which is how to actually transmit physical small packets uh, phys over these physical links. And then what's more interesting uh, for us in this class, at least, is the network and transport level, where we put together small packets into bigger ones that are reliable and figure out how to deliver a packet from here to uh, the other side of the world um, and deliver it to the right application on a particular node, okay? So that's kind of what we want. So protocols on today's internet, um, sort of showing you at least these kind of three layers, 
there's really four of them illustrated here. The physical and link layer are things like Ethernet or Wi-Fi or LTE. That's one hop worth of communication. The network ties it together with IP to uh, transmit data uh, multiple hops. And then the transport layer starts worrying about things like how to deliver to an application directly and how to do um, uh, reliability and so on, okay? So to start with, I wanna say a tiny bit about uh, the physical link layer. So to do that, we're gonna talk about broadcast network. So broadcast network is a shared communication media. And although uh, it doesn't have to be wireless, it can be a wired uh, situation. I'm showing you up here in the upper right corner, um, just uh, think of it as a broadcast network where we're sending to everybody can, who can hear us. Um, in, in the equivalent uh, view of this might be like a bus uh, where uh, all of these items, a processor and a bunch of IO devices and memory are all attached to the same wires. And as a result, when the processor sends out a request, uh, everybody can listen in, okay? And so the shared medium could be a set of wires or it could be uh, you know, the space around a Wi-Fi, et cetera. Uh, what's perhaps interesting here is Ethernet in its original incarnation actually uh, was used as a broadcast media where you had a whole bunch of uh, items, here's three workstations and say a router, all connected over to the same cable and all communication basically went to everybody all the time, okay, in a local subnet, all right? And, um, many examples of this, okay? Cellular phones, CDMA, LTE, Wi-Fi, et cetera. So um, what's interesting about a broadcast network is when I'm sending from say uh, this uh, node here to from node say three to node two, and I'm sending my data over that broadcast media, what it really means is that every one of these nodes have to look for at least as long as the, until they get the header to know whether they need to uh, observe or can just ignore the packet, okay? And that header address is typically called a media access control address, a MAC address. And um, most of the things you're gonna encounter now are 48-bit physical addresses, MAC addresses. And in theory, which is kind of amusing, they're supposed to be unique for every device everywhere in the world. It's supposed to have a unique 48-bit address. And there's, uh, there's a special way to, uh, to identify the various tuples in these 48 bits that have to do with manufacturers and um, which item number it is and so on. Um, there are some reserved bits that are supposed to be settable, so those are not necessarily unique. And uh, any of you who have played a little bit with your networking stack on your machine know that in many cases you can just set a software version of this into the network card and it will ignore its own ID for the one you tell it to. So this idea of things being unique is uh, more aspirational than real, but um, every card that does come out should have a unique address. Um, so how do you deliver this when you broadcast a packet? Well, you put a header on the front, which is a MAC address, and everybody gets the part packet and discards if uh, it's not the target. And typically this is all done in hardware, so the software stack doesn't have to deal with it too much, okay? Now, um, I did wanna say, uh, give you guys one little interesting tidbit here. So uh, as you can imagine, if everybody's on a broadcast media and multiple nodes start talking at once, you're gonna get chaos. And so how do we deal with that? All right, well, the way we deal with this is uh, in fact something called uh, CSM, uh, CS, uh, CMAD called uh, Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection. And it's uh, from the early 80s, uh, Ethernet. And it was the first practical local area network. Um, and uh, Ethernet has, um, most of the Ethernet protocol has survived for the last uh, many years, okay? Almost uh, 30, 30 years, 40 years, okay? And uh, it uses a wire instead of radio, but it's still a broadcast media. And the key advance to making this work was this arbitration uh, mechanism, CSMACD, uh, and how that works is as follows. Uh, everybody who is uh, attached to the network, uh, when they start talking, there's a carrier that goes out. And so what that says is before you talk, you listen. So that's carrier sense. And if you hear somebody talking, you just don't say anything until they're done. So that's uh, a way to avoid talking over people, okay? And uh, however, it's possible that both 
nodes uh, start talking at exactly the same time, so they don't hear anybody. So what they do is they start talking simultaneously, and at that point, they both are listening to the medium at the same time they're talking to, to, to uh, notice when there's a uh, collision, okay? And if there's a collision, then both nodes stop talking and they back off and retry la later, okay? The back off scheme is basically choosing how long to wait before trying again. And uh, how do you determine that? Well, if everybody always waits the same amount of time, then you're just going to collide over and over again. So instead, what happens is uh, you basically have a random mechanism for randomly backing off. Okay, and so it's an adaptive randomized waiting strategy. You don't want to wait too long because that's going to destroy your bandwidth. So what you'd like to do is figure out how long to wait, but do so randomly. And so what happens is you uh, first time you pick a random wait time within a small interval. And for every time you collide, you up your interval. And so um, basically uh, what happens is the, uh, the average for the wait times keeps increasing uh, by a, do a factor of two every time there's a collision until you eventually get to go. And so what's nice about this uh, CSMACD uh, protocol is it automatically figures out probabilistically how far to back off so that if you have two people uh, trying to talk versus four people trying to talk, there's a different back off process. And this works remarkably well. And uh, it still is in most of the uh, ethernet stacks that you're gonna run into, okay, are gonna do this uh, back off. So that basically gives us a way to deal with a broadcast media, even when there's multiple people on there. So the question about how does the sender check for collisions is really that um, you notice that uh, your bits are being trampled on top of by uh, somebody else. So you can see that there's checksum that's failing. All right. Um, so let's say a little bit about the MAC address here for a moment. So it's a unique physical address at the interface. Uh, if you were to look, if you were to take 168, you'd see that this is typically the physical and data link layers, okay? And uh, what's interesting is I just wanted to mention uh, for those of you that uh, might take a look on your phones, you can see that the Wi-Fi um, uh, uh, hardware of your phone has this 48-bit address. So um, notice this is six uh, double hex digits, so that's 48 digits. Um, and also, uh, if you do something like if config on a Windows box, et cetera, uh, you can see that, like, here's the wireless LAN, uh, LAN adapter has a 48-bit MAC address, and your Ethernet adapter has one as well. So every one of your physical system items in the system have a, a MAC address. So um, you might ask yourself, all right, so why have a shared bus at all? Why not simplify and only have point-to-point -point links? And the answer is, well, originally it wasn't cost effective. Uh, originally it was much easier to drop a cable that snaked around a whole floor. In fact, I, um, my, uh, where I was graduate student, originally we had one of these that was uh, up in, um, in the ceiling and they dropped down and we attached it to every one of our machines and there was a shared media for uh, every network, uh, for every machine on the floor, okay? Um, however, you can imagine that's got bandwidth issues because you'd like to have point-to-point -point networks where only the communicators are actually communicating. And so that would be a network in which every physical wire is connected to only two computers. And so how do we do that? We get a switch, all right? And so in that instance of a switch, what we have here is the switch is a piece of hardware. We've got point-to-point -point connections, okay? And this is a bridge typically that transforms the shared bro uh, bus broadcast media into a point-to-point -point network. And uh, you can buy switches pretty much anywhere. You can get them at Fry's for Ethernet. Uh, and what happens here is even though you can, in principle, broadcast or multicast everybody uh, that's connected to the same switch, if you're just doing point-to-point -point communications, the switch adaptively learns where all the, what all the MAC addresses are. And when you send a message addressed to a particular MAC address, then the switch basically just routes it internally to the right port. And now I can get uh, as many pairs as I've got going here, depending on uh, how much bandwidth my switch has, okay? 
Now, a little different than that is a router. And what a router does is it basically is a way of transferring packets from one switch domain to another. And so when you go across a routing domain, they're not routed by MAC address and something else has to happen. And this is the point at which IP comes into play. All right, so we're gonna take our brief break here and uh, we will be back in just a second. Okay, so, uh, so IP, um, as you're all aware, is the protocol that has really taken off. It wasn't the only protocol originally for uh, routing across physical domains, but now it pretty much has taken over. And uh, basically it's a way of getting packets from some source to some destination, uh, no matter how far away it is. And so this is the internet's network layer. So if you were taking 168, you'd see third layer protocol. And the service that it provides is best effort. So what does that mean? That means that when I send packets from source to destination, they can get lost um, or they can get uh, corrupted or they could get duplicated or they could uh, arrive out of order. Okay, and so really um, you might say it doesn't guarantee much, but surprisingly it guarantees enough to um, make our very interesting packets, uh, very interesting um, applications that we're all uh, used to, that we know and love, okay? And um, so the IP packet itself uh, is called a datagram, and this is a datagram service, which uh, can route from source to destination across many hops across the planet, okay? And so that's remarkable that it works as well as it does, okay? So um, there are IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, uh, the IPv4 uh, address space, which is much more common still, uh, has an address that's a 32-bit integer. So notice that's different from our 48-bit MAC address. Um, and it's the destination of the IP packet. It's often written as four dot-separated integers. So here's an example. Uh, for instance, at one point, the file server for CS was 169.229.60.83. Um, sometimes you see it written as, uh, as a set of hex digits like OXA9E53C53, et cetera. Okay. Um, a host on the internet is a computer connected directly to the internet, and the host has one or more IP addresses used for routing. Um, some of them may be private and unavailable for routing, so not every 30 of the 32 bit addresses can go everywhere, um, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but groups of machines may actually share a single IP address. And uh, in that case, uh, we can get what's called network address translation. Um, I'm sure many of you who have networks in your house um, have a router to uh, a service provider like Comcast or what have you. And that router then connects to all of your devices, uh, maybe either wired or Wi-Fi. And what happens in that instance is the, uh, the world sees your house uh, with a single IP address, but inside you have local addresses. Okay, and network address translation turns the uh, query from your laptop through the gateway to the, to the world uh, from the local address that your laptop has to, uh, to the remote address, and it does so in a way that uh, keeps that connection unique and allows it to work. So what's interesting about this is uh, the number of network connected devices in the world is tremendously larger uh, than just what you get by seeing all of the 32-bit addresses that are reachable uh, in the public internet, okay? So network address translation gives us that capability. Um, now within this, uh, a subnet is a set of networking, uh, network that's connecting hosts with related IP addresses. That's typically, for instance, either that broadcast domain or that switch domain I mentioned earlier. Um, and a subnet's identified by a 32-bit value with the bits uh, that are differ set to zero. So an example here might be 128.32.131.0 slash 24, or the other way to do that is 128.32.131.xx. What this says is every host address that matches in the first 24 bits, but not in the last eight, is considered together and on the same subnet. All right, and typically that's a set of machines that are all connected together either in a common switch um, or on a same, the same physical um, network, okay? And oftentimes there's a mask uh, 
which uh, can be used to identify the subnet. So if you uh, look at this address, uh, 128.32.131, that 24 bits there re represents a unique subnet. Uh, and then the last eight bits represents the host. And the mask, this 255.255.255.0, uh, 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 is 24 ones and eight zeros when you and it uh, on top of 128.32.131. whatever address, you get only those 24 bits that represent the subnet. All right, and so often write, routing within the subnet is done by MAC addresses by the switches, not necessarily by IP addresses. And in fact, a lot of the uh, ports that are in, for instance, Soda Hall, um, there's a lot of MAC address routing that's going on in uh, on the subnets there to make it fast. Okay. So address ranges in IP. I'm not going to go on this in, in great detail, but um, back in when it was first started up, uh, when IP first became very popular, there were what were called Class A networks, which are ones that um, that only have the first um, the, that only have the first octet uh, unique. So like a 10 dot something dot something dot something or a six um, or a 127 dot something dot something dot something. Those are Class A addresses. Um, MIT, for instance, is 18.xx.xx.xx.xx. And so what that means is all of the two to the 24 hosts um, are all kind of owned by that organization. Now, there's a question about uh, not covering uh, what's the difference between a MAC address and an IP address. We'll say more in a moment, but the MAC address is 48 bits and it's only uh, routes within a switch domain. And IP is what routes across switch domains through routers. Okay, so think of a MAC address as a physical uh, address attached to a, a, an actual network card, and an IP address is a, um, a virtual host address that is used for routing on the larger scale. So um, class A basically is a slash eight network where the first eight bits are unique, class B the first 16 bits, and class C the first uh, 24 bits. And um, some of these are what are called private networks. So for instance, 10 dot uh, something that something that something is a private address that's a class A. And so if you were to use the VPN at Berkeley and log in, you'd find that your computer has a 10 dot something address associated with that VPN. Um, commonly, if you buy a router at Fry's or at Best Buy and you um, put uh, you put one of those routers on, uh, on your network, you'll see that the 192.168 is a very common class C um, network that's used a lot um, and is private, okay? So, um, oh, by the way, how are MAC addresses different from ethernet addresses? I guess I didn't quite answer the question that was on, uh, on the uh, group chat. So the ethernet addresses are the MAC addresses, okay? Those are the, those are the MAC addresses. Okay, so address ranges are often owned by organizations and can be further subdivided into subnets. So for instance, the, um, you know, I said a, uh, MIT is one of few, the few institutions that actually has a class A uh, address and um, they certainly don't have two to the 24 hosts all tied to a single physical domain. Instead, they're all divided into a bunch of subnets which are then physical domains. But um, the class A address is something that MIT has full control over those addresses. All right. Now, the IP4 uh, format, as you've seen, if you've taken 168, um, is a set of uh, bytes that go in front of uh, the data. All right. And um, it's a well defined format. I'm not going to go into it in detail. But what you can see here is, for instance, if you look uh, in the packet header, um, there are, there's a four in there for IPv4. There's a total length of the packet um, in bits. There's some flags. There's a checksum. Um, and then there's a source and destination IP addresses. So the source address is where it comes from and the destination address is where it's going to. And this is a basic IP datagram. All right, and this is sent unreliably from one host to another. Notice there are no ports in this. We'll get to ports in a second, but IP uh, can only go from machine to machine, not from application to application. All right, so now what's a wide area network? It has many of these physical domains, okay? So the internet is a wide area network. Um, 
it connects multiple physical data link layers with routers. So you can see these routers. What goes on inside of the subnet is kind of up to the owner of those devices. So even though I kind of show that host A um, enters into this uh, domain and then goes through R2, R4 uh, to the destination, it's possible there are other hops inside here which are handled by the owner of this domain, um, either via MAC addresses or something else. Uh, the data link layer networks are connected by routers, as I mentioned here, okay? And we can, uh, we'll see mo say more about a router here. So a router forwards each packet received on an incoming link to an outgoing link. So here the router is circled. And what this says is that if a packet needs to go from point A to point B, and it goes through a router, we have to make sure that when it arrives at the router, it knows, the router knows what the next hop is, okay? And so um, the router uh, is a highly uh, optimized piece of hardware software um, device that basically takes packets coming in off the network on a, you know, 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit link and is able to often at line speed, if it's owned by uh, Comcast or some service provider, can basically pull the packet in, find, just, uh, take the header off, figure out what the next port is and send it on its way at line speed, hopefully by basically keeping this thing going at one gigabit or 10 gigabits or 100 gigabits, whatever. So here's an example of packet forwarding. So here we have host A is talking to host B. And as you can see here, basically on receiving a packet, the router, figures out how to forward it. What's the way to get it closest to the destination? And um, if it doesn't know anything about how to get it closest to the destination, then it might send it to a default route, um, which hopefully has more information. Okay, so here's an example of that packet going on. Did everybody catch that? See? Do, 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 do. All right. So what about IP addresses versus MAC addresses? Why not have everything routed by these 400, uh, these 48 bit MAC addresses? And the answer is it doesn't scale that well, okay? Um, the analogy here is MAC address is kind of like a unique social security number that everybody has, and an IP address is kind of like your current home address. So the nice thing about your current home address is you can hierarchically say that it's uh, in some state, which is in some, you know, and it's in some city in that state, and it's in some, uh, sub piece of the city in that uh, city and so on. And so you can do hierarchical routing to home addresses, whereas hierarchical routing to social security numbers isn't doable because uh, each social security number is assigned uh, uniquely to a person and it's not based on anything to do with locality, but rather based on the person, okay? And so a MAC address is kind of like a social security number. It's uh, uniquely associated with the device for the entire lifetime of the device. And so, um, you know, your, your IP address changes depending on where you are. So when you're at, uh, in Soda Hall, your laptop gets one IP address. When you're in the dorms, it gets a different one. And when you're back home, it gets a different one. And that's because by and large, not exclusively, but by and large, IP addresses relate to uh, physical locations, okay? Um, and so if you look, basically, uh, if we move, then um, we're moving our address to something new and therefore it's easier to route. Okay, so, I, um, so why uh, does packet forwarding use IP uh, uh, and why does it scale better? So we just kind of said that, but uh, specifically IP addresses are aggregated and hierarchical. Okay, so I, all IP addresses at UC Berkeley might start with an OXA9E5. Okay, in reality there's 128.32 and one sixty nine dot two two nine dot da da da. Those are the two ranges that represent UC Berkeley addresses, um, but it's that aggregation that helps the routing. Okay, all right. I think I've said enough on that. And yes, there is somebody who's noticed that the first uh, few digits of the social security number uh, were originally based on sort of where you were born, but people move around a lot, and uh, the social security numbers are in the position I think of being recycled now. So. Um, I think that original locality of social security numbers is, uh, you know, there is no actual locality uh, as a result. Okay. So how do, you, how do you set up the routing tables? Well, the internet has no central, centralized state. Uh, no single machine knows the entire topology of the internet. In fact, it's fascinating um, to read books on the topology of the internet because the internet is a whole series of loosely collaborating uh, 
uh, administrative domains that have uh, a set of agreements with between each other and there's cross point places where certain classes of I or certain groups of IP addresses will route quickly while other ones will route more slowly and this is all based on uh, agreements and so um, no single machine knows the topology and the topology is always changing and there's faults and reconfigurations and so on and so uh, you really need a dynamic algorithm that somehow acquires the routing tables so that we can even figure out how to get a packet onto its next hop. And so there are many possible algorithms you could imagine. Okay, one of the, the one that's uh, common now is called BGP, uh, but the, you know, the routing table has a cost for each entry that sort of reflects how many hops it will take to get to a certain destination address. And there is some optimization for hops, okay? And neighbors periodically exchange routing tables to try to make this, uh, to, to optimize for cost. The problem is this particular uh, algorithm um, that optimally tries to eliminate, uh, or optimally tries to have the fewest number of hops, square, uh, scales is n squared, and so that's not generally what's done in the internet. Instead, there's basically whole groups of addresses that are um, run at different scales and so on, and so uh, your path from point A to point B is certainly not optimal in the internet. And in fact, sometimes um, there are loops, and so uh, you can actually have situations where packets on their way to their destination get routed in a loop and they just keep looping around and they would loop around forever if it weren't for the fact that there's a time to live field that keeps getting uh, decremented and eventually they time out and go away. Um, and there've also been some pretty interesting disasters uh, back in the, um, I think in the early 2000s, there was a single tunnel that had fiber that partitioned the internet. And so one side of the internet was on one side of that fiber and the other side was on the other. And there was a truck fire in there and it actually took out the ability to communicate across the internet uh, until they fixed it, okay? There's a lot more redundancy now, but um, this is a pretty chaotic process and it's fascinating. Uh, and good reason to take 168. I'm sure they talk about internet routing. The, the other thing I wanna talk about here is these internet uh, or these IP addresses either uh, IPv4, which are 32-bit IP addresses, or IPv6, uh, which are 128-bit IP addresses, uh, are really not necessarily ones you can remember easily. And so really, since we've got humans in the picture, we need to go from name to IP address somehow. Uh, and how do we do this? You know, we wanna map something like www.berkeley.edu to 128.32.139.48, or Google, dot com to believe it or not the closest google uh, facility that can service you so um, these human readable names need to go to ip addresses so that the underlying system can then route them and how do you do that uh, well you need a system that um, goes from human names to ip addresses and uh, this is necessary basically because you know humans have trouble remembering ip addresses um, unless they are particularly attached to them uh, and IP addresses also change. So uh, if one server crashes and an alternative comes up, you'd like the name that the humans are using to automatically switch over to the new one uh, so that um, they don't have to know that there was even a failure. And so the mechanism for this, as many of you know, is called the domain name system. Okay, and the domain naming system is hierarchical. Okay, so there's a top level uh, of the hierarchy that's uh, managed by a centralized organization. And then um, uh, for something like berkeley.edu, the next level down is edu, and then there's berkeley.edu, and then there's eecs.berkeley.edu, et cetera. All right, and so it's hierarchical, and organizations own parts of the hierarchy. Okay, and this top level organization is just a really big organization that's global, okay? So it's a hierarchical mechanism for naming. Names are divided into domains uh, right to left, as I mentioned. Um, so start with edu, then berkeley.edu, berkeley then eecs.berkeley.edu. And uh, let's see, resolution is a series of queries. So when you're uh, somewhere and you wanna get to uh, you know, mit.edu, then um, here I'm attached at Berkeley. I might see whether my local cache has a, has a um, address, and if it doesn't, then you work your way up the hierarchy to get to um, the edu uh, domain, which will then tell you where mit.edu is, and then it'll uh, send it back to you 
for a full resolution or may tell you how to get to mit.edu, which then has the server you're really interested in. Okay, and there's caching because this is expensive as you can imagine. And so what's interesting is um, the caching is loosely consistent. And so it takes some time for the cache to time out. And so if you make a query and it gives you one answer and then something changes, you don't always get a very quick change to the answer, okay, which, uh, is one of the reasons that DNS is not great if you've got items that are moving rapidly and changing their IP addresses with some frequency. So you need something uh, different. And uh, perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that in some of our remaining lectures. But how important is this correct resolution? So if you notice, when I'm trying to get to a particular server like www.berkeley.edu, I need to know that it's 169.229.131.81. And I wanna do that in a way that um, maybe a malicious person can't get in there and, and give me the wrong answer because that could at minimum deny me service and it, uh, it could also potentially be a security hole if I um, am not careful and notice that uh, this server is not the one I thought I was talking to, okay. Um, so uh, how important is the correct resolution? Very. Right, so get somebody to route to a server thinking they're routing to the different server and get them to log into their bank and give up their username and password. Now, of course, um, one of the ways that banks prevent this is by having certificates, but for certificates can also be faked under some circumstances. And so uh, an incorrect DNS resolution complete with a breach top level uh, certificate can lead you to route to something and give up your username and password if, uh, if the wrong sort of circumstances happen. So you might ask, is DNS secure? It's definitely a weak link in this whole process because you think you're talking to one thing and you're actually talking to something else. Uh, and the answer is DNS is uh, not always been secure. Uh, what was interesting is in July 2008, there was a hole in D DNS that was located um, and the security researcher actually discovered it and then quickly informed a bunch of authorities about this before it was published uh, in a conference. And it was a very high profile uh, problem. And basically, uh, because DNS wasn't properly authenticated, it was possible for one node to send out a query to, uh, to a top level um, DNS server, for instance, and somebody quickly comes in and gives a different answer uh, and it wasn't noticed that the person answering wasn't the one that we were asking uh, the question of, and you could actually pollute the DNS caches of a whole uh, ISP uh, in one swell foop, so to speak, one fell swoop, sorry, joking. And um, as a result, uh, this was a pretty serious bug. All right, so uh, DNS is definitely a weak link and it's had many uh, upgrades over the years here. So, um, so, now moving on, we need layering in our network, which is building complex services from simpler ones. The physical link layer is pretty limited, okay? So um, basically, if you look at what can go on an ethernet link or a, or a Wi-Fi link, there's a maximum transfer unit size that's often in the 200 to 1500 bytes in size. And um, across slow links, uh, the MTU can get small, okay? And so packets actually, have to be fragmented up into small pieces to get over long distances and they have to be reassembled uh, or something in order to basically allow us to do something large. So our goal in the following uh, few slides, and we're gonna pick this up next time as well, is basically going from the physical reality of the networks to the abstraction we really want. So we're gonna go from packets, which are limited to messages, which are potentially unlimited. Okay, and this is kind of like our virtual machine abstraction we talked about at the very beginning of the le lecture, or at the very beginning of class, I mean. Um, so packets are of limited size, but we would like arbitrary size communication. Packets are not ordered uh, all the time. They can be reordered. We'd like ordered messages. Packets may be unreliable and lost. We'd like reliable ones. Uh, packets, basic communication is machine to machine. We would like it to be process to process instead. Um, packets might be only on a local area network, so using the MAC addresses, whereas what we'd like to is route them anywhere. Um, they might be in asynchronous uh, because they're just sort of being sent when the hardware is ready, where perhaps we want something synchronous where we can do some synchronizing on it. 
Um, packets might be insecure, we want secure ones. And so this is basically an abstraction process of giving us a better communication uh, mechanism than what the hardware gives us, okay? So that's a theme that we've had throughout the term. So um, process to process communication is a good one to start with. So, uh, you know, machines have an IP address. And so um, that's a machine to machine communication. What we really want is routing from process to process, uh, which, you know, process on machine A to process on machine B. And the way we do that, as we've talked about earlier, is by adding something in addition to the IP address, we're gonna add ports. And so basically a communication channel, which we, uh, have mentioned is actually a five tuple of source uh, address and source port. That tells us what application we're talking to at the source side, destination address, destination port, that tells us the application at the destination side, and then a protocol which tells us uh, sort of what level of transport protocol are we using, and the protocol, what uh, those protocols are things like TCP or UDP, et cetera. And just to see the simplest example of, uh, of a protocol, this is IP protocol 17. And remember the protocol field, if you were to look back at the header earlier, uh, is, a, is an eight bit field. So when we fill that eight bits with 17, uh, the number 17, that's gonna be up in these 20 bytes. Then uh, we've got a datagram. And in addition to that, we add a new header, we wrap a new header on this, which has a source and destination port. Uh, which now let uh, UDP go from a, an application at one side to an application at the other. And there's some additional things like a link for our UDP data and a checksum and so on. But um, very, uh, very simple protocol here for UDP. It's an unreliable datagram from uh, application to application, and it's often used for very high bandwidth video streams, et cetera. Um, but you can be very antisocial about your use of UDP if you send too much and you fill up your network. Okay, um, so um, it has none of the well-behaved aspects of TCP IP, which we'll talk about next time. Um, so just to uh, finish this out, if you guys could bear with me, I have a couple more slides I wanna make sure to get through here for today. But um, process to process delivery is technically a layer four or a transport layer thing. Okay, and so if you look, what we start out with our data, we start wrapping headers. So our data gets a transport header, which like the UDP header, which adds a port to it. And then we wrap a network header, which gives us the IP address of our destination. And then we wrap a MAC address on top of that. And uh, that might be our ethernet address, for instance. Okay. And then it, uh, so this is going through several different layers in the operating system, down to the physical layer where the data is actually transmitted and then it comes back up uh, at the other side and we start unwrapping the data link layer. So we only get to a node who has the same MAC address as our desired destination. It comes in, we strip the, the frame header or the data link layer header off. We, we put, bring it up to the networking layer. Um, that networking layer is gonna check. Um, and uh, this, for instance, could be a router, in which case we see, oh, this isn't the right IP address. We're gonna forward it back down to a different data link layer, layer out of a port. But if it turns out this is the IP address of the local node, then we'll forward it up to the transport layer, which will grab the port, and that will further demultiplex it by forwarding it up to an application. And so this idea of wrapping headers and unwrapping headers is a common theme in all of the layering that you're gonna run into. So there are many transport protocols. We just talked about UDP, um, which is considered best effort IP and is protocol 17. Protocol 6 is a pretty common one that you're well familiar with called TCP, uh, which offers a bunch of it, uh, more um, semantics than, I, than UDP. So it lets us uh, set up and tear down connections, discards corrupted packets, retransmission of lost packets, gives us flow control and congestion control, which really means that if we use TCP across the planet, for instance, um, the flow control and congestion control will actually make us uh, good citizens and we won't use more than our fair share of the network links. Okay, so that's uh, a nice property of TCP. There are actually a bunch of other examples that are kind of uh, often not heard of, but things like DCCP, which is a datagram congestion control protocol. Uh, RDP is a reliable datagram protocol. SCTP, the stream control transmission protocol. These are all transport protocols um, that you may not have heard of. <laughs> 
Uh, what's interesting about SCTP, for instance, is this is uh, like TCP, but has a bunch of different streams that can be simultaneously connected. Um, the, T the transport protocols do not provide a bunch of, uh, of services, okay? That's up to applications. And so when we get into things we can do with, for instance, UDP and TCP, like distributed storage or peer-to-peer -peer storage, uh, we'll be able to do things like provide bandwidth guarantees or surviving change of IP addresses or so on. Okay, so um, the, the problem we're gonna solve next time is the reliable message delivery problem, uh, which is basically how do we get reliable delivery out of unreliable packets, all right? And we'll pick that up next time. So um, just to finish up for today, in conclusion, we talked about two-phase commit and uh, as a distributed decision-making protocol, first you make sure that everybody guarantees that they will commit if asked um, or that they won't and then everybody asks to commit and through these two phases we're able to get and either everybody commits or everybody aborts uh, semantics as long as we um, allow people to reboot in the process we also talked about the byzantine generals problem which is a distributed decision making with malicious failures uh, one general n minus one lieutenants and some number of them may be malicious and here malicious is pretty much they can do anything they want um, and that maliciousness uh, can include uh, looking correct whenever they're probed, but still behaving incorrectly. And what we see is that um, it's only solvable as long as uh, the number of nodes is greater than or equal to 3F plus 1. Uh, we also talked about how blockchain protocols can be uh, used for distributed decision making as well. So we started talking about IP, which is a datagram packet delivery used to route messages uh, through routes across the globe. 32-bit uh, addresses for IPv4 and 16-bit ports. Um, we talked about DNS, which is the uh, system for mapping from names to IP addresses. Um, flaws that have been discovered uh, are problematic and they've been continuously fixed as they show up. Um, we started talking about uh, how to get good semantics and next time we're gonna talk about ordering and reliability, okay? So um, we'll, we'll finish at this point. Uh, I hope you all have a good Wednesday and we'll see you on Thursday.